this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Indeed, we are so glad to gather together, virtual as it may be, to worship our God today, this day here at the United Christian Parish. We are four denominations united in ministry, the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, the Presbyterian Church, USA, the United Church of Christ, and the United Methodist Church. Four denominations united together so that we can show to the world that what unites us is stronger than what divides us. Welcome again to this place, an open welcome and affirming place. Glad to have everyone here worshiping with us this day. Today we will have a brief moment to hear about some of the work and ministry that is going on here at the parish. You'll get to hear a special moment for our missions ministry. Let our worship of God begin. With the spirit of our whole selves, joyously, we come to this time of worship. Glorious creator, sovereign sustainer of all that is good, we give thanks for you and for your salvation and your paths that lead us toward righteousness. O oh God, unashamedly, we trust in you as our shield and unapologetically, we expect your righteousness to guide our lives. God of hope, may your redemption and steadfast love grow us to know your ways more clearly, to love your ways more dearly. Creator God, may integrity, clean conscience, and upright living preserve us to see and to know your signs of covenant love and to hear your wisdom. Mighty God, this journey of transformation in our lives and in our world brings us to this time of worship. For this sacred journey and your covenant promises, we give you our praise and our worship. As Christ's community, we are invited to consider how we live as followers of Christ, to look at our decisions and our actions according to our covenant as disciples of Jesus Christ. In this time of prayer, we offer our confession before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have turned away from those in our world who have needed to leave their homelands today, like Abraham and Sarah once did. We have not remembered that when we speak of immigrants and refugees, we speak of Christ. Now take a moment for your own personal confession. Merciful God, through the divine values of Jesus, you have called us to relate to every stranger seeking refuge and to the least of our brothers and sisters as your word has shown us. 
merciful Christ, open our minds and our hearts to your gracious invitation to model your perfect example of love and your forgiveness. In Jesus Christ, we all are forgiven. plate might look empty, but you have filled this offering plate virtually with your online and mailed in gifts this week. Besides the connection you foster with God through your giving, know that your offerings are helping the continuing work of this church out of the building and in the community. Let us pray together. Generous God, thank you for blessing us. Even as so many suffer during these difficult times, we share the fruits of our labor in worship with you. Help us draw close for strength so we may do your work in this world. Amen. Sorry, uh, I was looking for some of the stars that are not so easily seen without assistance like binoculars or whatever you might have, telescope. But there are certain stars like the North Star that are easy, easily seen at night with the naked eye. As a matter of fact, uh, Harriet Tugman, she used the North Star to guide her as she led others to freedom during the Underground Railroad. And then there's Sirius. It's called the Dog Star. As a matter of fact, this particular star that could be seen as among the brightest stars in the night sky, it was used by those in Egypt to warn them when there would be periods of flooding of the Nile River. The stars guide us. They give us information and they inspire us. In the 15th chapter of Genesis, we are told the story of one of the great leaders of faith whose name was Abraham. And Abraham had a vision. Abraham was concerned about whether God was going to keep a promise. When God told Abraham that he and his wife, Sarah, would have a child and that that child would be an heir to both Abraham, and to all the people that would, would follow. And because Abraham was worried of whether that promise would be kept, in Abraham's vision, God invites Abraham to leave his tent, to go out, into the night sky and to look and to see the stars of the galaxy. 
And God said to Abraham, I'm going to keep my promise. As many of the stars in the sky, try and count them. Because that's how many that will be a part of your, your heritage, your descendants. I've heard it many times said that only when it's darkest can we see the stars. And sometimes when things seem the most troubling for us, those are the moments that faith counts the most. And so as you are working, most of you in virtual classrooms, learning at home with the assistance of parents and grandparents, family members, siblings, friends even, this could be a very challenging time for you some difficult moments because you more you would love to be in in the classroom with your friends doing the things that children do but i hope that you will remember that there are some very simple pleasures and lessons for all of us in life and one of them is that at night Things seem to have a magical appearance to them. And in the dark skies, one of the most magical things are the stars. They remind us that we're not alone. And they remind us that we are a small part of this grand universe. And that the universe it includes us, it makes room for us. And we should make room for each other and for God to show us the way so that we can get through this pandemic together and that when we can gather again in church, in school, in public arenas, it's going to be even grander because we know what it means to have not been able to experience some of these things that are so important to us. And I hope that you will always be encouraged to look up, to see the stars, and to know that God always keeps the promises made to you and I.
Listen to the word of the Lord. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. The witness to God's word. Genesis 15 is one of the biblical texts that we will hear and experience in the narrative lectionary's fall theme, promises made, promises broken. Throughout the history of God's people, God has made covenants or agreements offering promises between both God and God's people. The narratives reveal a pattern that God kept those promises that were made to the people, but often the people would break their promises that had been made to God. The intent of Genesis 15, and indeed the entire Bible, is to teach us that the character and values of God should be our guiding principles that govern our behaviors toward one another. Genesis 15, and indeed the entire Bible, teaches us that God keeps the promises that have been made. And God is gracious enough to forgive us whenever we break those promises that we have made to God. It is one of the distinctions of being a Christian community, living within a covenant relationship with God. One of the mystics of the Middle Ages Julian of Norwich wrote, God, your goodness, give me yourself, for you are sufficient for me. I cannot properly ask anything less to be worthy of you. If I were to ask less, I should always be in want, but in you, I have it all. One of the challenges of human beings is that very often we approach our relationships with our hearts and our minds, both clouded by and crowded with the suspicions from previous promises broken in prior relationships. And it is unfortunate that we take this approach to God as well as to the church. Not every one person is capable of keeping a promise. Not every person is capable of keeping every single promise. And so in a world that experiences broken promises in relationships, broken promises in governments, broken promises with one another, some ways we have made a mess of things. And so we aren't surprised by the Eloist creative dialogue between Abram, who would be known as Abraham, and Elohim, God, about trust righteousness, and a divine promise that had been provided to Abraham that he would have more than an heir, but a seed in his old age. Abraham took the step of faith, leaving his homeland, trusting God, and traveling to the places through Canaan and others. Abraham worshiped God by building altars, and yes, there was the incident where Abraham went into Egypt and he did not tell the truth about his wife, Sarah, but even there, God's protection was with Abram. Abram stepped out in faith to recapture his nephew Lot. Abram worshiped God by tithing to Melchizedek. Abraham was, was victorious throughout the temptations 
with his encounter with the king of Sodom. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 3, Abram expresses his concern of when he might receive the seed, not just the heir. He was concerned about the culture, the codes, that if he did not have a son, then what he had would be left to his servant, Eliza. Eliza had been a good man. But remember, God had previously promised Abram a son who would be a descendant. And so in the vision that Abraham has, God takes Abram and asks him to look at the stars, to recognize one's dependence upon God. This man of character, Abraham, one who had been celebrated in the face of Islam, Judaism, and our very own Christianity. For it is Christianity that it celebrates Abraham, that Jesus' heritage comes through that such a lineage. Abram, which means the father is exalted. His name is changed to Abraham, meaning father of a multitude. When God initiated the covenant with Abraham, we read of that in Genesis chapter 17. Abraham trusts God, believes in God, and through such trust, it is reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. Well, can't God use an heir as well as a seed? Abraham said, my God, what can you give me seeing that I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eliza. Can't God use an heir as well as a seed? Eliza of Damascus was believed to have been the son of Nimrod. Eliza was the head of the patriarch Abraham's household. And Eliza served faithfully. He is mentioned as perhaps not only a servant, but that word ben mesik, meaning butler or steward. And while Eliza was indeed the servant of the household of Abraham, others also have mentioned that perhaps it was Eliza who had accompanied Abraham when he went to Sodom in order to rescue Lot. There is also the story that this servant, Eliza, that it was he who assisted in finding Rebekah. Truly, God should be able to make room for the heir as well as the seed. The heir, one who I'm sure when he heard of Abraham's worry and concern, that he may have also wondered about his own place his own value in the world. I'm reminded of a night in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th, 1968 when there was this there was a reason for a young preacher who at that time saw the world as perhaps a mess and remembered the words, God of your goodness, give yourself, for you are sufficient for me. I cannot properly ask anything less to be worthy of you. If I were to ask less, I should always be in want, but in you alone do I have all a servant, God has made provision for the heir and the seed. 
And it is in such a way that both receive the promises. For Abraham, Eliza uses the galaxy. In history also, God uses the servants. That night in Memphis, Tennessee, God used a humble servant in which he exchanged longevity for the labor rights of sanitation workers. Those employees that he wanted to teach, that they had a right to justice as well as lawyers and doctors and pastors and others in our society, that others could not see such a pathway. But on that night in Memphis, Dr. King said, only in darkness can you see the stars. It was a perfect quote for those dark times when all seemed lost. And Dr. King points out that it is when things seem at their worst that you can find the beacons of light in your world that can help you see, steer the course. The world seemed a mess that dark night in Memphis, Tennessee, and it would seem even more so just a few days following his assassination. But God brought a vision to Abraham, said to him, look outside, look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And God said to Abraham, so shall your descendants be. The stars are not a sign to Abraham, but a rhetorical move to make a point about the promise in the face of Abraham's questions. And on that night, that, that fateful night in Memphis, Tennessee, a young preacher reminded the world about that metaphor, that figure of speech, that Abraham's descendants would be too numerous to count. But you could see in God's, the signature to all who will encounter the narrative that the stars are a reminder, an altar, telling Abraham and telling us that God's promises will always be kept. And it was that promise that Dr. King made to those that night in Memphis that we hear and that I, I pray that becomes echoed for us as so many things in our world, they presently do not seem right in order when it seems that the health of those who are sick should be at the forefront of our politics, when it seems that justice and equity and mercy should be among the first paragraphs that are spoken when we talk about where our attention and our direction for our country should be. We need to be reminded that when we feel as if the promises have been forgotten, the metaphor, the vision of Abraham was to look at the mystique of the stars and to realize that there is a great creator who is with us and that God does not break God's promises and that there are these moments in our lives when only when it is darkest, that we can see the stars only when hope seems left that faith counts more. And so when Dr. King said on that fateful night in Memphis, only when it's dark, can we see the stars? We must remember that there are great words from great people who through the guidance of our creator, encourage us, to not lose hope, not surrender the vision, not relinquish our faith. For these are the times that may seem dark for some. And it is that this moment in our time when we, the faithful, must encourage everyone. See the stars and know that the glory of our Creator is always with us. Amen. With the continued generous support of our members, we have been able to continue with the mission budget as planned. It is divided into 60% for local and national, 
30% for international and 10% for discretionary. We are supporting financially the mission work of our four denominations, but also supporting organizations our UCP members have indicated as important to support. Besides donating funds as a church, we are also reaching out to our community by hands-on activities, like collecting food for the Cornerstone Pantry every Wednesday and the first Saturday of the month, supporting the Cornerstone Backpack projects for kids who cannot afford all the school supplies. We are supporting Lake Ann Elementary School by donating art supplies that we also collect on Wednesday mornings, supporting the parents and kids of Lake Ann Elementary School with food gift cards. UCP members help distributing food at Lake Ann Fellowship House and Hunters Woods Fellowship House. These are just some of the ways UCP is reaching out in our community and the wider world. You are encouraged to read our parish newsletter each month. You will find a detailed report on all of the activities of the parish ministry. Our God flings stars into space and says, see, you are all my children, each and every one. We come, the stars in the skies, the sand on the shore, all God's children everywhere, drawn to God, drawn to love, drawn to worship, drawn to prayer. And as we gaze up at the night sky and look in wonder at these tiny dots of light, we remember that God once promised Abram that his descendants would number more than the stars in the sky. We are his descendants, billions of us living thousands of years after Abram, linking his story with our story, which is all together God's story. And so, let us pray. Loving God, promise maker, you promised Abram descendants as many as the stars, and here we are. Thank you for keeping your promises then and now. Oh God, this year continues to batter us, and we wonder when there will be relief. We find ourselves weary, wondering if we will dwell in this season of uncertainty and stress forever. Everything still feels unsettled and upended. Tasks that used to be accomplished without much thought require planning and additional energy. Children attend school in their homes or in buildings with multiple protocols for distance and safety. Parents attempt to work even as they contend with limited or non-existent childcare, helping with online learning and the anxiety of tending to multiple and competing needs. Some, of us, some among us now face not only unemployment, but the end of unemployment benefits. Others struggle with illness or feel overwhelmed with grief. Some are sick lonely or anxious. O oh God, may they find consolation through Christ's healing presence. And we pray for those facing economic scarcity, those worried about meeting their basic needs. May those of us with two coats give one away, and those of us who have more than their daily bread share with those who have none. And even as the pandemic persists, natural disasters do not stop. We see images of smoke-filled skies, leaping flames, and the carnage of fires ravaging the West Coast. And once again, hurricanes pounding the Gulf Coast. We grieve for those impacted by these tragic events. We pray for firefighters and first responders putting themselves in harm's way to protect others. We ask for your strength for all the people reeling from the loss of property and possessions. And we plead for you to comfort those mourning the loss of life. 
Your generosity to us is evident even in our anxiety. You give us a community of faith that upholds us in our weakness, encourages us when our hope lags, and makes your love tangible when we feel alone. When we struggle to see your providence, you sustain us with your spirit. When we fear you have forgotten us, you seek us out and enlist us for your work, giving us purpose and meaning no matter our circumstances. When we are overwhelmed by the pain of the world, you reveal your glory and the beauty of creation. And when we wanna turn away from suffering, you send your son showing us your resurrection word cannot be silenced. Enlist us all, Almighty God, to work in your vineyard in ways that participate in your will and ways so that all may experience the abundant life your Son came to give. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. So we leave this time of worship together, left to be the servants to our neighbors and in out the, throughout the world. Now may the God of peace, who has brought back from the dead our Savior Jesus Christ, who is our great shepherd of the sheep, by Christ's eternal covenant, make you and I complete in everything good so that we may do God's will, working that which is pleasing in God's sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>